Hello and welcome to our conversation today. I'm Kent Lassman, the president of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and momentarily we'll be joined by two of the sharpest legal advocates that you'll find anywhere. Today we'll focus on a just released book, Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court. It's brought to us by Ilya Shapiro. And you may know Ilya from the aggressive amicus program he leads at the Cato Institute, where he serves as the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies. If you're not yet familiar, I encourage you to take a look at the work that he publishes each year. It's the Supreme Court Review. And as a special treat for this timely and important discussion, I'm especially pleased to welcome back to CEI, Jonathan Adler. Professor Adler is the Johann Verheet Memorial Professor of Law at Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the founding director of the Coleman P. Burke Center for Environmental Law. It's a whole lot of law in just two sentences there. Now I say welcome back because Jonathan was an early employee at CEI. He led our environmental studies program. And I believe he wrote his first book on free market environmentalism while with us. But today we're looking at the Supreme Court. It sucks up a lot of oxygen in our political discourse. But that's not to say that its purpose, its history, or even its direction is very well understood. Now I find Ilya's book easy to recommend. I think it works for the political or the news junkie just as well as for the reader who has a passing interest in history or how our government works. It's even handed, thorough, and a reminder that much of the mess we see in contemporary political life, it has an echo from previous eras. As a result, there's an opportunity, if we take it, to learn and apply those lessons. In just one moment, I'm going to bring Ilya and Jonathan into the conversation. But first, I want to dispense with a couple administrative notes. Today's event is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube. Part of my role will be to interject your questions into the conversation. So pay attention and send me an email at events at CEI.org or use the Q&A function you find at the bottom of the screen. Finally, we're providing a service to you. Having reviewed the book and with knowledge of the caliber of our guests today, I know you're getting a great deal during the next hour. In return, I'd like you to give me about 45 seconds for a survey. When you log off of the program, a few questions will be prompted to your screen. Or if it's easier, just send us an email. Again, questions or comments on today's program go to events at CEI.org. We care deeply about your opinions on our programming and how we bring to you the most important ideas and analysis for the defense of liberal institutions. So with all that taken care of, Ilya, let me turn to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for writing such a superb book. I want everybody to go out and buy one. Uh, a couple clicks at Amazon will take, it, take care of it. Tell me first, who did you write it for? What's your ideal audience? Thanks for that, Kent. And I should add, uh, if you want to read it twice, you might want to buy two copies. Uh, and, and also, Kent, I noticed that you didn't welcome me back because I have a CEI tie as well. I was an intern at CEI 22 years ago, the summer of 1998. And in fact, I occupied John's office that summer because he was uh, out at Perk in Montana. Uh, and so I got a corner office and had a great time as an intern uh, in the in the bad old days, I guess. Uh, really missed uh, not having, due to COVID, the, uh, the annual uh, dinner gala, which for both my wife and I is the highlight of our annual uh, social calendar. Uh, so it, it, I have to interrupt here and just tell you, you've already taken one of my questions. <laughs> because I was going to share with everyone your tie to CEI and ask you if your next book will be for us. But <laughs> I'll step back and we can get into the conversation. As, as good free market oriented people, I'll say uh, uh, it will be for you if the price is right. Um, so who did I write this for? Uh, I wrote this for the people that you mentioned, uh, the educated layman who's interested in history or law or politics. Uh, I wrote this for uh, someone who wants to get the full breadth and sweep of judicial nomination battles uh, to use as a reference uh, when each one comes up. Wasn't necessarily expecting one to happen right as my book was released. The publisher had to pay for this kind of timing. Uh, 
uh, pay extra. But, uh, um, you know, this is uh, a subject that has uh, uh, really interested me over the years, and I've tried to weave in both uh, jurisprudential points, political points, historical points, uh, and, you know, as any author will tell you, I wrote it for myself as well, just to make sure that I had all of this important uh, uh, history, political and legal analysis uh, for, for me in terms of what I do on a daily basis. Now, J Jonathan, uh, jump in here. Uh, help me along. You, you both interpret what happens for the scholarly community. You, you're writing at that level. You're very engaged in uh, the debates about um, the, the law journals and, and the development of legal uh, pedagogy. But you're also, uh, I heard you last night on NPR. You're, you're all over the media. You're helping, as Ilya referred to it, the educated layman. Um, I want you to jump in here and tell us uh, some of the themes or, or what you want to pull out of the book for our discussion today. Well, I mean, one thing I think that, that is, is significant about the book and that's helpful uh, and is that the history of fighting over judicial nominations isn't new. Uh, and I guess about the first third of Ilya's book is, is very historical and, and you know, stuff that there aren't many folks, if any folks around that lived through. I mean, some of us lived through some of the judicial confirmation fights of the 80s and 90s and, and aughts. Uh, but uh, I think that the fact that we've been through periods of extremely contentious fights over judicial nominations and over the courts uh, is helpful perspective, um, both in terms of recognizing that this isn't entirely new and for some of us at least giving us some hope that uh, it might not be permanent. Um, you know, I, I found myself in the book at many points saying, well, gosh, you know, what happened with uh, these two presidents or with these nominations, there might be some historical analogs. I and mean, I'd be curious what Ilya's views of what the most analogous periods to recent history are. Um, but it is, it is to me striking how much of, of both the serendipity of who gets to fill spots and how and when, and uh, whether or not they're nominating the sorts of folks they think they're nominating and then what the partisan fight is um you know th these are these are not new developments that that uh, uh this isn't something that just emerged in the 21st century yeah that's that's definitely something that i learned that there really isn't very uh much new under the sun over the broad sweep of history whether you're talking about the merrick garland situation of nominees not being acted upon we've had that 10 times uh whether that be just these contentious periods that that you mentioned um for example um well i mean politics has always been a part of it i mean george washington had a nominee rejected uh, about half the presidents have had some trouble filling seats for one reason or another uh, some periods have been more contentious than others between andrew jackson and abraham lincoln so basically the 1830s uh, through the 1850s, only eight of 21 nominees were confirmed. This was a, a time where obviously the slavery question was paramount. And also the parties were realigning, different factions coming out, the Whigs arose uh, and then collapsed and became the Republican Party. The, the Democrats became the Jacksonian Democrats and all of that. Uh, then you have a period from about the, eight, the late 1880s until 1968, when only one nominee was rejected uh, under under Hoover, uh, and um, uh, you know now um, uh, the advent of television and and kind of the media focus, people might think it's uh, you know that's really what's something new. But I would argue that the most the, the single most contentious nomination historically was in 1916 with Louis Brandeis, who was the first Jewish nominee, but even more than that was a, uh, a progressive crusader, very controversial positions on uh, regulation and, and, and other things that were part of Woodrow Wilson's uh, agenda. It took nearly five months to confirm him. Uh, the margin, the final margin was a little wider than some of the more recent controversies, but uh, still. Also, for the first time, uh, we, the Senate held hearings on a nomination. It's not like that's required by law, let alone the Constitution, but they held hearings. The nominee himself, Brandeis, did not testify. That was seen as 
unseemly. Uh, but wait, even more that, that uh, contentious year, after Brandeis was confirmed, just as Charles Evans Hughes resigned to run against Woodrow Wilson in the presidential election. So if you think that 2020, 2016 show uh, uh, an unprecedented politicization of the court vis-a-vis -vis the presidential election, what have you, I'll, I'll see that and raise you 1916. Could you uh, elaborate? Because it, it seems to me one of the themes I, I kept seeing uh, about the politics of nominations had to do with geography. How, did, how have presidents used regionalism and, and that sort of, uh, I mean, it's much more like a legislative debate almost who to select for much of our history than uh, about jurisprudence or ideas of, of some sort. Yeah, it's a fairly novel development um, uh, to have these battles be over judicial philosophy. Uh, the, I, I describe the modern era starting in 1968, and we can talk about why. My book is like Gaul is divided into three parts. There's the, the past, the, the history, and then the, the middle part, the present, roughly the last 50 years. And then uh, part three is uh, looking at reform proposals or what have you learned and, and, and what have you. Um, but the... Um, the other criteria, the geography has pretty much fallen away at this point. You know, we've had uh, uh, until recently a court where four members were from each from a different borough in New York City, plus Alito from New Jersey, very heavily uh, uh, that way. Uh, but in the early days, yeah, it was part of the way of uniting the country and giving legitimacy to the court to have a Virginia seat and a New England seat and a Pennsylvania seat and and, and things like that. And there are certainly presidents ran into trouble when they tried to appoint a Southerner to the Massachusetts seat or, 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 or vice versa, um, uh, as well as having to placate different factions within their parties and things like that. Uh, last night's vice presidential debate, Kamala Harris actually uh, misstated something that uh, a consideration that Lincoln had. He didn't, when there was a vacancy that arose, Chief Justice Taney died about a month before the 1864 election. Lincoln refrained from uh, putting up a nomination for that seat, not because it would be breaking norms or, or the, you know, who the winner of the election should fill the seat, but because there were different factions within his party that would have been pushing for different candidates. The Senate was out of session. They wouldn't have taken it up till December anyway. Uh, and he didn't want that to be the focus uh, of the race. And, and then he eventually uh, nominated and had confirmed someone in the lame duck. But he certainly wouldn't have, even if he'd lost, he would not have let that seat go to uh, McClellan. Uh, but, so, but anyway, politics, always, region, whether regionalism, party factions, satisfying some other uh, concern, or at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft started considering the quote, real politics. So it doesn't matter if you're, what your party label is, are you a progressive for uh, Roosevelt's purposes? Are you kind of a deregulatory classical liberal type uh, for Taft? Uh, that sort of thing, which is a little different than now, but, but still you see the, the different considerations that come in. But they didn't always get it right. Uh, uh, the, uh, your, your discussion of McReynolds uh, made me think of him as like a, an early an early 20th century suitor in that he he shared um, uh, his, his cultural type uh, aligned with the pre the nominating president um, uh, Woodrow Wilson known for uh, his retrograde ra racial views which McReynolds certainly had as well suitor the New Englander um, President Bush who nominated him certainly had that genteel New Englander. Uh, a cultural background, um, but on the court, uh, neither performed as the nominate the, the nominating president would have hoped. Yeah, I, I've I've never explicitly made the suitor to McReynolds uh, connection, but uh, that is an example of um, you know presidential misfires or not getting the results they might have expected. Uh, and frankly, it's hard to predict what the issues are going to be 20 years down the line when a president's making a nomination. But yeah, Woodrow Wilson, who was not some country bumpkin, I mean, he was learned about the law. He was a professor of jurisprudence at Princeton. And I mean, he was very wrong about his ideas about the administrative state and how we don't need checks and balances and, and all that. But he knew what he wanted and he knew what kind of jurisprudence he wanted. And so he appointed Brandeis very much of his, of his mind. But then McReynolds, with whom, uh, as you said, uh, there, there's the, the, the bigotry and the racism, but in terms of policy, 
uh, I think antitrust they agreed on, which was a, a key issue during the nomination. But otherwise, yeah, this uh, McReynolds became one of uh, what, what was known as the four horsemen, uh, the votes against the New Deal program 20 years later. Uh, and, uh, you know, very about as different from Brandeis as you can get. In fact, would not be in the same uh, photograph. Uh, they didn't have those class photos because he didn't want, he was so anti-Semitic, didn't want to do that. But he, he was so uh, uh, obnoxious, even beyond kind of, quote unquote, conventional bigotry that a couple of his colleagues resigned from the Chevy Chase Country Club so they wouldn't have to come across him. Yeah, McReynolds was quite the cantankerous character. And by the way, Wilson had a third nominee, uh, James Hessen Car Clark, who was uh, a footnote in history at, at most. So even though Wilson most engaged and most uh, you know, thought about the Supreme Court more than most presidents, still had uh, very different uh, nominees. You mentioned uh, so Brandeis being the first hearing, but he doesn't testify. I forget now, is the first, you, you mentioned who the first justice to testify, was it Frankfurter was the first? Frankfurter was the first one in 38 to submit to general questioning. When, when Harlan Stone was nominated, there was a question about one kind of mini scandal on, on which there was some some testimony, but it wasn't kind of this free ranging thing, but it didn't become a, uh, after Frankfurter, I think there were a few that didn't testify. I think it didn't become standard practice until the mid fifties. Right, and then I guess notoriously Thurgood Marshall, especially for his second circuit confirmation is questioned pretty extensively on desegregation related questions. Um, you know, we're about to have hearings next week. Uh, are, are, are these hearings worthwhile? I mean, did did was there wisdom in the in the pre Frankfurter or pre uh, Brandesian practice? Um, I think they were valuable for a time um, when we didn't have access to every nominee's voluminous writings uh, instantly on the internet. Um, I think at this point, uh, each player. Uh, there's a set playbook. You know, the nominee has to talk a lot and appear erudite without saying much of anything. Uh, you know, Robert Bork did not follow that playbook. There was no playbook yet at that point, and so he did himself no favors by actually trying to substantively answer the questions and educate the senators and things like that. But anyway, the nominee tries to do that. The senators from the party uh, of the president making the nomination try to toss softballs and, and make this person seem uh, both personable and smart. And the opposing party asks gotcha questions uh, or just whatever will, can go into their uh, uh, ads for, the, for their next uh, re-election campaign. And so you don't learn much about the nominee. You don't learn much about the law. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the whole thing becomes, you know, at best, kabuki theater and at worst, just mudslinging that uh, uh, does, uh, detracts from our public discourse more broadly. So one of the things I actually say in the book is, that I've come to the uh, conclusion that, at least for the Supreme Court, we shouldn't have these public hearings. The, uh, the Senate can still have, as they do now, closed sessions to discuss the FBI background check or sensitive financial records or other things that come up. Uh, but otherwise, maybe going back to the earlier days where, uh, or the Brandeis model, where you had people testifying for and against, perhaps, and, and they can be questioned, but at the, um, yeah, w what we have now, I don't, I don't see, I, I think the, the costs are greater than any benefits. Could, Ilya, could you explain one of the innovations in the playbook uh, you, you describe, I think quite nicely, is uh, Justice, then Judge Bader Ginsburg's pincher movement. Uh, are we likely to see that next week? Is that a play that's still being run by nominees as they come before these committees? Right. So, so uh, Ginsburg, who was coming along uh, six years after Bork, two years after Thomas, um, uh, basically said she wouldn't comment on specific fact patterns because that might come before the court. And then she wouldn't comment on general theories because judges should deal with real cases uh, only. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Judge Barrett is going to be that explicit in making those sorts of things, but certainly I, I don't expect to learn uh, much of anything having gone through her record and you know, written a little bit about her jurisprudence. Um, I, I don't expect to, to, to learn to, to get answers that I, that I didn't have uh, previously. Oh, and one more interesting tidbit about the Ginsburg confirmation is that uh, pro-choice groups were a little wary, this sounds amazing in retrospect, uh, of uh, then Judge Ginsburg, because six months before her nomination, she had given a speech 
at NYU saying that Roe was uh, too early, the timing was bad, it was done the wrong way, it kind of poisoned the well for our legal and political discourse, which is all correct, and other uh, leading liberals have said uh, as well. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, there was some, uh, there was some concern uh, by certain organizations that she would be wobbly on, on, on Roe and, and abortion. What about the, the time frame of the process? So, I mean, you know, Judge Barrett gets nominated, lots of conversation, oh, how could you do it this quickly? Um, right, there's, there's this statistic that since 1975, which is a, a not a accidental uh, cut point, um, the average time has been about 70 days between nomination and confirmation. Ginsburg, I guess, was what, 44 days, 43 days, somewhere in that ballpark. But as you noted earlier in the conversation, Sam and Chase was confirmed the day he was nominated. Um, how long should it take? Uh, you know, if, 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 if the president and senator of the same party and they and the Senate either trust the president or thinks they know what kind of judge, getting, you know, should this be something that's thrown out for weeks? Should we do it in the afternoon? I mean, what, what, if, 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 if you were designing the process, how long would it take? Well, it's not a matter of designing the process and setting new Senate rules. You know, there shall be hearings after X days and then a vote after Y days because it's purely political. Um, I mean, the, the next week, the hearing is going to be done just to uphold norms, I suppose. But I don't know if any senator's vote is going to be changed. I mean, there's going to be an interesting moment where Kamala Harris, the vice presidential nominee, questions the Supreme Court nominee. That's never happened. So that'll be a, actually a, a new thing. Uh, but uh, uh, generally, this is, uh, as I said, a, a kabuki theater going through the motions, making sure all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, and at the end of which, uh, you know, the Judiciary Committee will approve by a party line vote, and a, a week later, Mitch McConnell probably has the votes on the floor, and, and away we go. But it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's so much about politics that uh, historically the greatest determinant of whether someone is confirmed or not, and this seems like a banal truism, but needs to be said, is whether the same party holds the Senate and the White House. If there's that united government, then confirmation rate's about 90%. If it's divided, then it's uh, under 60%. And that, that uh, difference is even greater in presidential election years, where this is the 30th time where a vacancy has arisen in a presidential election year. 19 of those times has been united government, and 17 of those 19 has been a confirmation. Uh, 10 times have been divided government, uh, like Merrick Garland, and only twice have there been confirmations, one of those after the election. So just knowing nothing else about the political moment now, uh, or for that matter in 2016, you could have anticipated what, uh, what would have happened because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's politics all the way down. If, if it is politics all the way down, that might be the perfect segue for uh, a question we have here from the audience from Bill. Uh, he asks, if an empowered and determined majority attempts to pack the court, what can a minority do to stop it? Well, I mean, according to Senate rules, uh, first, uh, there's a filibuster, meaning uh, currently that's uh, 60 votes. And so the Democrats would first have to get rid of that. And that can be just a majority vote. They get rid of that. And then they uh, uh, add however many justices uh, they want. Uh, and the minority in this scenario, the Republicans will have lost the White House and the Senate and uh, uh, will hue and cry and, and take it to the media. Uh, currently, it seems like court packing is, is uh, about split. I've seen some polls. It's not overwhelmingly uh, against. Uh, it's, it's split. Um, and so whether that's enough for the more moderate Democratic senators, including, again, in this scenario, uh, some who are coming from states like North Carolina, Montana, Arizona, uh, whether that's enough for them for one of their first acts uh, in the Senate to be to get rid of the filibuster and uh, and then and then add Supreme Court seats, uh, I don't know. But no, it's this, this is this becomes uh, you know a calculation of uh, can we get away with this? With will this hurt us? Will the benefit from packing the court um, you know uh, be greater than whatever political cost we might suffer? And historically. Um, any party that's proposed a court packing, whether it's been successful or unsuccessful, uh, that has not inured to the long-term benefit of the party that's, that's proposed it, uh, let alone for the country. Uh, you know, most recently, this is FDR 80 years ago, uh, but there was uh, where after having been overwhelmingly reelected, 
uh, in, the, in 1936, this is the uh, as goes Maine, so goes Vermont election. He won all but those two states. Uh, the, next, the following year, frustrated at the Supreme Court's uh, rejecting his New Deal programs, he proposes to add uh, six more justices to help out the old men uh, who might not be capable of doing their job. Uh, his vice president campaigns against it, not just the chief justice, who is now Charles Evans Hughes, uh, came back to the court after you know, a political career, uh, and Louis Brandeis, uh, towards the end of his career, comes out against this. And the Democrats end up losing 80 seats in the House and, and eight in the Senate uh, at the following midterm, hugely unpopular. A couple of years later, Roosevelt gets to pack the court the old fashioned way by maintaining power and uh, replacing the, the, the folks that rotate off. But in the 19th century, we also had this thing, shenanigans between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, and then Jefferson trying to add more seats to counteract the capital F Federalist control of John Marshall unsuccessfully because Marshall's so convincing and takes even the Jeffersonian nominees under his wing. Then an expansion for Jackson, which leads to Dred Scott. Uh, and then for Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, I mean, all of these things, uh, it's always been done for political reasons and it's never, um, it's never worked out quite the way that the party that proposes it wants it to. With all of this, uh, the third section of your book details recent history um, and wherever you started from with, with Bork or uh, the circuit court problems in the early aughts uh, nominees there. With all of this tit for tat, can either of you imagine a situation where following the lead of the uh, Chief Justice who talks so much about the integrity of the court and the integrity of the judiciary, that a nominee would opt out and say, I'm willing to meet with any member of the Senate to provide them information privately, but I'm not available for public hearings. Hmm. I would be surprised to see that happen. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I, I mean, we know that there are people, I don't know about at the Supreme Court level, with the exception, I guess, of Mario Cuomo, um, who reportedly or allegedly uh, told Bill Clinton he did not want to be considered. Um, certainly at the appellate level, we know of people who refused to be considered for uh, judicial nominations in part because of the current confirmation process. Again, Mario Cuomo, then governor of New York, I believe is the only person that uh, in modern times that pulled themselves out of themselves out of Supreme Court consideration. I don't know if, if Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt would have been another, but, but that's pretty rare itself. But once you're in the process, I mean, typically you're in the process. Uh, but, but again, it's, it's not like the Senate Judiciary Committee is going to subpoena someone. They could, no, just, but, they could just threaten to vote against. And say, or not vote at all. Public. Yeah. I mean, so I just, you know, um, there was a little bit of drama with, um, which I can't remember if, if Ilya talks about this or not. There was a little bit of drama in the Gorsuch nomination where uh, there were uh, comments that uh, were, that a senator said, Senator attributed comments to Judge Gorsuch based on their private meaning that were critical of comments the president had made. And there have since been news reports that the president considered with uh, uh, pulling the nomination because President Trump did not like being implicitly criticized by his nominee. And there is a, an event that was reported where when this was shared with, with Gorsuch, Gorsuch saying that you know he could be back on a plane to Colorado and uh, would do so, but wasn't going to um, wasn't going to say something he didn't believe or 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 disavow his comments, and it seems to have dissipated. Um, so we've seen that, um, and maybe there. Uh, and and then, then there's the the Harriet Myers withdrawal um, because she wasn't performing well in her meetings with the senators as well as at the, the, the prep sessions, the, the so-called murder boards. Uh, and so nominees can get uh, derailed even, even in modern times. And then Judge Ginsburg, uh, then Judge right. Ginsburg, who withdrew technically before he was nominated. So if you go yeah, does, to- Does not appear in, uh, this is after Bork, before Kennedy, there was Doug Ginsburg and 
man, that would be a different court if it had been him on, on, on the court all these years. But I call him the last public casualty of the drug war because I can't think of any other public official whose career has been hurt by revelations of, uh, well, certainly not marijuana use, maybe even harder drugs. Um, and by the way, uh, if, if viewers really want to nerd out, if you go to supremedisorder.com, not only can you buy the book, which you should every chance you get, but there, you can download for free uh, a PDF, it's about 21, 22 pages of all sorts of statistics and, and historical data arranged by, you know, length of time to confirm or uh, political split or unity or, you know, all the longevity, all these different things that if you really want to be popular at uh, Zoom cocktail parties, you can uh, nerd out on. One thing I was going to note on the, um, on the, on the Ginsburg uh, quasi nomination is, um, uh, you know, people may recall the vacancy with uh, Rose in 87, Bork is nominated, he's rejected by the Senate in 87. Ken, uh, Ginsburg is then going to be um, nominated. At the time, uh, the Reagan White House was aware that Senate Democrats were trying to slow down the rate of confirmations across the board. And there in fact was concern that the drug controversy, um, while it might not have ultimately stopped or, or itself caused a majority of senators to vote against uh, Ginsburg, it might have been enough of an issue to delay confirmation. And the, the Reagan White House was concerned about that. And one of the reasons um, uh, there was such a quick shift to uh, Anthony Kennedy was the desire to have someone that the Senate would in fact confirm. Now it turns out the Republicans win that election anyway, uh, but one of the stories that people forget, and it's a lower court story, so people don't talk about it very much, is that um, Reagan had put up nominees for both the D.C. Circuit and the Ninth Circuit who would have shifted control of both those courts, Judith Hope for the D.C. Circuit, Pam Reimer for the Ninth Circuit, and the Democrats refused all year to hold hearings or votes on either of them because they were hoping that uh, their nominee would win the presidency and that they would be able to keep uh, control of those two courts um, uh, and of course they lose. Pam Reimer ends up getting confirmed. So we forget about what, what had been done to, to, to her uh, uh, by Senate Democrats. And then we forget about Judith Hope completely because she's not renominated because she had supported Bob Dole in the, in the primaries instead of George Bush. And so George Bush eventually taps uh, someone else for that seat on the DC circuit. Um, but this, you know, back then we were already seeing the beginnings of holding seats open for elections uh, to maintain partisan control and concern about timing as something that could affect confirmation when the Senate is controlled by the other party. There was also a dry run for the, the Bork attack on ideology with the nomination of Bernie Segan to the Ninth Circuit. He is a very libertarian law professor at the University of San Diego and uh, ended up having two hearings uh, and, and, and no vote. Uh, you know, he was first nominated in February 87, so right after the Democrats took over uh, the Senate. Um, this is one difference from 86 when Scalia was confirmed unanimously uh, to 87 when, uh, when, when Bork was uh, nominated. But Bernie Segan was a kind of a dry run for attacking, uh, in this case, a lower court nominee on judicial philosophy. Could, Ilya, can I ask you to step back uh, just for a moment? for the audience and put in context um, the relationship between the three branches of the federal government and uh, maybe explain a little bit why a seat at the Supreme Court has become so valuable, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, the activity or lack of activity of the Congress in the last couple decades. Sure, sure. So first of all, uh, Civics uh, 101, uh, all of the Constitution says about this is that there shall be a Supreme Court and such lower federal courts as Congress may create. Uh, and uh, the president shall nominate and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges to this Supreme Court. That's it. That's all it says. What does advice and consent mean? Well, we have history, we have precedent, but the, as far as the law goes, as far as the Constitution goes, uh, that's it. Uh, originally, by the way, the Senate was going to be app appointing justices. And then at the very end, according to Madison's notes, uh, that shifted to, to, to the language that, that's there now. Um, 
And uh, as I said, historically, we've had nominees postponed or this euphemism postponed indefinitely. I love that senatorial procedure, not acted upon, rejected, uh, withdrawn. A few that have declined to serve after learning that they were confirmed. In the early days, communication moved slowly and you know, some people didn't want this low prestige job where you had to hang out in the basement of the Senate and not hear very many important cases or be under the wing of John Marshall, you know, and ride circuit literally on horseback, go to the far flung states and help out with the, uh, the nascent federal judiciary. So it wasn't necessarily appealing. But anyway, um, the reason why uh, we have these cataclysmic battles are there, there's two dynamics. First is the power of the court itself and therefore the power of each seat. Um, uh, there's a centralization of power in Washington that is a subversion of our federalism. So power is drawn up centrally. And then there's a subversion or warping of our separation of powers because Congress passes fewer and fewer legislation, at least not, uh, not with any specificity. You know, they, they might pass the Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Act of 2020 and then uh, let uh, the you know, Secretary of Health and Human Services Energy or the EPA or whatever uh, flesh out the regulations by which we actually live our lives. And every year, there are many, many more pages of regulations than statutes uh, enacted. And why is that an issue? Well, it means that uh, if you don't like this rule that you have to abide by, if you're a property developer or a small business owner or you know, a financial uh, advisor, what have you, that you're being regulated, uh, you can't uh, tell your congressman that that's a bad vote because he's like, no, I voted for truth and beauty and goodness. That's that deputy undersecretary of whatever that uh, is causing you grief. So you have to sue them. You can't unelect civil servants. You can only sue them. And so all these, those disputes uh, get uh, to the Supreme Court. And then at the, so that's the power angle and why each seat is powerful. And then at the same time, you have the culmination of several trends where divergent theories of constitutional and statutory interpretation map onto partisan preferences at a time when the parties are more ideologically sorted than they've been since at least the Civil War. Uh, and so in a zero sum game of there's only a finite number of seats uh, that are powerful with different views, well, of course, you're going to have these fraught battles. And then the, the senators are responding to their incentives to either do you know, whatever they can to confirm or, or reject uh, or you know, stall the particular nominee. So, can, we, can we unpack that a little bit, uh, uh, the divergent views? Because I think there's a lot there that uh, those of you in the legal uh, world uh, take for granted that everybody understands. And, and I wanna make sure that we're, when, when we read in the newspaper about a 6-3 court, the potential of a 6-3 court, they're not talking about six men and three women. They're not talking about religion or geographic balance. They're talking about how people approach the questions and, and what are the basic uh, distinguishing features. It's, it's not Democrat, Republican. It's not a uh, liberal conservative because I'm not sure that means much. How, how are they really doing their work differently? Yeah, it's unfortunate that that shorthand gets used. I even sometimes use conservative liberal just because it's the way you talk about it for a, for a general audience because you don't have the space to go into all the, all the nuance. Um, but the idea is uh, Republican appointed judges or justices. And by the way, it's a new thing for all of these so-called conservatives to be Republican appointed and all the so-called liberals or progressives to be Democratic appointed. That's a, that's a fairly novel development. Um, so on the, on the right side of the court, um, the Republican appointed justices or the lower court judges uh, tend to be originalist or textualist, which means um, you interpret constitutional provisions according to their original public meaning. So the 14th Amendment due process or privileges or immunities, what did that mean in 1868 when it was ratified? The Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, what did that mean in 1791 when it was ratified? Uh, or for statutes, you look at the text uh, and you try to interpret that text uh, according to how it works together with other parts of the text, rather than trying to um, empower the purpose of the statute, whatever you think that might be, or uh, the intent of uh, divine, the intent of the Congress that enacted it, uh, or try to be, I guess, pragmatic about it, or, um, you know, Justice Breyer has this active liberty idea, which we can go into. So anyway, originalist, textualist versus kind of purposivist, pragmatic, uh, uh, living constitution 
type thing, the, the, the words change over time, the meaning of justice uh, changes, that sort of thing. And there's, uh, as far as the results end up, there tends to be more separation on the right side of the court. Uh, some are stronger originalists, some are weaker, some prefer to empower stare decisis, that is, sometimes you even let erroneous precedent stay there because it causes more disruption to overturn it. Uh, a John Roberts cares more about minimalism and, and not rocking the boat and being restrained than he does about any overarching uh, theory. Uh, those on the left tend to, at the end of the day, uh, at least in the most controversial cases, end up in the same place for whatever reason, not because they're result-oriented necessarily, but just the, 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 the philosophies or the, the, the theories of jurisprudence map on, uh, map on that way. Now, one, one thing that comes out of your book and your comments that you just made is that one reason we fight so much over Supreme Court nominations is because we don't, they don't happen very often and the Supreme Court makes a lot of big decisions on a lot of big questions. And um, it seems that if, if we don't like the, the ugly fights over confirmations, we don't like it because we don't think it's good for our politics. Perhaps we don't like it because we don't think it's good for the courts and the respect and legitimacy of court judgments. It seems that the only two things we levers we have are make the court less important, which I think means either the court being more restrained, being less, less judicially engaged, uh, uh, or maybe Congress doing things like jurisdiction stripping, or reduce the, the significance of each appointment by having a much larger court. Um, my, you know, I don't think you're a big uh, uh, advocate of either of those two strategies. So, so does that mean we should just buckle up and be used to the fact that we're going to be fighting hammer and tongue over over judicial uh, confirmations, and that's the cost of a, of a court that that is engaged on public issues? Or is there some other way to think about it? The reality of it is, uh, until and unless the parties realign again, which, you know, may happen, uh, you know, we, we're in a populist moment of sorts, and who knows what, uh, where that ends. Um, yeah, I mean, because the right now, everyone's responding to the incentives uh, that they face. And actually, there's a third, I, I don't like restraint, because I think judges are there to do a job. And that's to interpret the Constitution and the law as, as best they see fit. And then we're supposed to argue, voters and their representatives are supposed to argue about whether that's the right theory to, uh, to empower, which is why I think that the conservative legal movement in responding to the so-called activism of the Warren Court in the 50s and 60s was wrong to say, no, 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 that's activists. We want judges to be restrained. I'm like, well, if political actors are violating the Constitution. You don't want judges to do anything about that? You know, that's not the right response. It's like, that theory is wrong. Here's a better theory. That should have been uh, the, the, the healthier response. And, and therefore, um, you missed an option uh, in addition to like not doing anything at all. There's doing a whole lot more to enforce federalism and the separation of powers, which for uh, the short term would be controversial because you're all of a sudden invalidating acts of Congress for delegating legislative power to the executive. You're invalidating acts of Congress for usurping uh, or going beyond the power given to them under the uh, Commerce Clause or, or, or what have you. But in the long term, if there's more power back in the states and localities and with the people rather than the federal government and rebalance so Congress is making politically controversial decisions and hashing that out rather than the court, then that will make the court less, imp uh, less important uh, in the long term as well. That's a decades long solution because it took us decades to get warped uh, to the place where we are. And as for the number of justices, yes, uh, by definition, if there were 19 justices, each seat would be less significant. And presumably there'd be fewer 10 to nine votes than five to four ones now. So if we were drawing up a constitution from scratch or designing a Supreme Court from scratch, you'd probably want more. And what, you know, historically, what I think should have happened is that every time a new circuit was created, there should have been a new justice just organically that way. And we should probably at this point have three or four or five more circuits just because they've grown uh, so big. I have a law review article called Break Up the Ninth Circuit, but not because it's, progressive. I mean, that's an accident of, of history, not geography. But, but anyway, 
Um, the problem is getting from that point, from the nine to the 19 or whatever the platonic ideal might be. You know, some, some countries have an even number of Supreme or constitutional court justices. So you need a margin of at least two to make any kind of ruling. We can debate that, but the problem is how do you get from here to there without further politicizing and further uh, intoxifying, if you will, uh, all of this process? If I could push back on that a little, uh, on the first part of what you said, because because if the court is more aggressive in enforcing constitutional limits, for example, say on Congress's power, I'm not sure how that leaves room for Congress to be making the, the, the politically hard judgments because the court is restraining it. And why wouldn't the natural reaction of Congress to be um, to try and constrain the court and the surest way to constrain the court would be to make sure only those justices get confirmed that uh, align with congressional preferences. I mean, there's, there's an argument here, I think, that the more often the court restrains Congress, the more likely it is that Congress will emasculate the ability of the court or the desire of the court to do so and that therefore from a liberty enhancing standpoint, it might be better for to have a court that in some respects keeps its powder dry for the really big decisions, the really big congressional or even state level abuses, not one that is regularly engaged uh, uh, in, in policing these boundaries. How would you respond to, to that argument? Sure. Um, well, I mean, it's not clear whether on net Congress would have more or less power because it would have less in terms of, uh, you know, many things going back to the to the state level to be decided. Uh, but it would have more because um, some of that stuff that it punts to the administrative state would be back in Congress. And I think the same way that uh, Madison didn't foresee uh, the rise of the uh, party system and and uh, therefore that uh, Congress would be less jealous of its prerogative to maintain its uh, legislative powers. Um, the similar dynamic will say that uh, depends whose ox is being gored. So if Obamacare is struck down, the Democrats in Congress wouldn't like that, but the Republicans would if, um, you know, whatever, wh whoever's, whichever party's project is the one that's being invalidated, they're the ones that would be upset, not Congress, I think, uh, as uh, as an institution, but uh, you know, would there be juris jurisdiction stripping after a time? Maybe on social issues. That's the, that's kind of the other piece of this, which we haven't talked about. You know, whether it be abortion or guns or you know, gay marriage or, or these other things, which after all have nothing to do with or little to do with um, uh, the administrative state dynamic or the uh, the federalism dynamic. This is 14th Amendment claims about the scope of rights that are under the federal constitution that uh, at the end of the day, the, the federal judiciary is policing against state violation. Um, so the, the most juris jurisdiction stripping would, I think, target those kinds of concerns uh, rather than these more, um, you know, the federalism or separation of powers ones. I'm seeing a theme here with our uh, questions. So I'm going to try to pull you both back into the here and now. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we do have uh, a nominee coming before the Senate next week. Um, I have a question here from uh, one of the writers at, my, uh, at a favorite source for legal analysis, the Volek Conspiracy, uh, hosted over at Reason Foundation. Uh, big fans there. I encourage everybody to go check it out. Uh, but it's about the hearings themselves. And once the question seeks your input or your reaction to the idea that the hearings can have value because in addition to the nominee, other witnesses are called who can either uh, put forward defenses or criticisms of the legal approach of that nominee or highlight important issues that the nominee would not be highlighting. Do, do you find merit in that argument for the hearings because the ability uh, the Senate panel can call other uh, witnesses. Yeah, that was a, that was a question by uh, the other Ilya, Ilya Soman, uh, who uh, also has a, use anyone who also has a, a, a book out these days. Uh, so once you've exhausted, once you've bought up all of uh, my book, that's currently in print, uh, go, go check out his. Um, uh, yeah, when we were discussing the hearings, I don't know if uh, if Ilya Soman joined joined late, but uh, 
I mentioned that the, you know, the, 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 the early days of the hearing where the nominee himself uh, or now herself uh, didn't testify, maybe there's utility about, you know, learned scholars or interest groups testifying about their jurisprudence and raising issues. That might, uh, that might have some actual, some, some educational uh, interest. It wouldn't be uh, rife with uh, gotcha moments, uh, perhaps. I mean, you know, senators will try, I suppose, but leveling those at proxies where many fewer people are watching wouldn't be nearly as as satisfying, I, I suppose. So, so let me uh, there, there might be a benefit to that. For, for both of you, the, another normative question. Um, if you're called this afternoon uh, by the, the lead counsel and Senator wants your advice on how to run the hearing, what do you tell them? How would you advise senators to run the hearing next week? John, you want to take this one? Oh, sure. I mean, um, uh, hire good attorneys to ask the questions. Um, I mean, you know, I think part of the problem with hearings today is the senators are playing for an audience. They feel the need to take time to expound upon their own opinions about things. And so you don't actually get questioning that actually goes somewhere. So in the case of Judge Barrett, there's been discussion about what her view of precedent is. And that matters because you know, there are a lot of areas where, the, where there, at least some justices want to reconsider precedent about say the non-delegation doctrine or about qualified immunity. And we'd like to know what a prospective justice's view of, of precedent might be. But if you really want to get into that, that doesn't work if, you know, Senator Blumenthal wants to spend two minutes with a wind up about why he is so concerned about this issue and why he's so troubled by something he read of this of the nominees out of context and then trying to do a gotcha question. So, you need a so, question where you're, you know, phrasing the issue in a way that, um, uh, that, that calls for a substantive response and then the ability to follow up on Right, so Jonathan, I, I, I think I hear you making an argument for expert unelected staff. Oh yeah, I, and I think not I, for I, uh, I, people that are politically accountable to the electorate to run these hearings. Well, I think that that the that that if the goal, I mean, I, I would be fine with there being being no hearings at all. I would be fine with hearings where it's purely subject matter experts, you know, explaining to the senators and by extension the American people. Um, what conclusions they draw from the work and scholarship of the nominee. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I've been skeptical of hearings for a while and reading Ilya's book reaffirmed or, or turbocharged my skepticism given the history of hearings and given the fact that through most of our history, uh, since we've had hearings, senators have been incapable of using them in a productive way. So, you know, having, having a, a, a subject matter experts ask questions I think would be better. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I think all of these reform proposals are rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic because they're trying to address process issues when the the um, fundamental problem is product, as we've been discussing. The, uh, the, the, the Titanic is the ship of state, and you have this constitutional uh, disorder, supreme disorder, you might call it, uh, and therefore, um, you know, all of these other things uh, are uh, addressing the symptoms without going to the root of the problem. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Uh, quick, uh, maybe the last question I'm able to squeeze in from our audience. Uh, it's it's about the trend that you you mentioned. I don't I don't know that you uh, spend too much time on it, but I think it's of great interest for folks. The trend for the Supreme Court to to hear fewer and fewer cases. Uh, is there a relationship to the number of justices to the quality of work that they're producing? What, why is that the case? I do say in my book that one of the advantages, again, if you were writing on a blank slate to create a, a new Supreme Court, why you might want to have more justices would be the potential to spread out more work and take up more cases, because I agree with the premise of the question that they're, they're, the Supreme Court is not taking up enough cases. There are really good vehicles that Cato supports and you know, other, in other areas that we're not involved in that are you know, perfectly good cases, with circuit splits, including. Uh, where, where the lower federal courts are divided, that the Supreme Court just turns down. And Chief Justice Roberts has said this is because there's now 
uh, much more uniformity and because of the internet, everyone, all the judges from all over the country know what everyone else is doing. And so they sort of get in line and there's less disparity and there's less, you know, a higher level of judging overall. I, I really don't think that's the case. Um, you know, he himself wants to avoid controversy. Uh, others in, in other cases just aren't sure whether they have five votes for whatever issue they care about. And so they'd rather decline a, a case than, than risk it going the other way at the Supreme Court level. But uh, perhaps if you had uh, more justices, um, you know, with, although, you know, if you had that 19 again, you know, I guess you'd need nine to grant cert. Um, that might be as hard to get to as four out of uh, nine is now. But I, I, I do think they should hear more cases. I, I agree with Ilya that it, it would be a good thing for the court to hear more cases. And I certainly agree that one reason the, the docket has shrunk, uh, I mean, there were, some there were some congressionally imposed reforms to the nature of, of jurisdiction in the 80s, but the docket has shrunk far more than, than, than that called for because there have been a critical mass of justices on the court who believe that if it's possible to not decide a question, they shouldn't. And so their default is to... Uh, not grant cases, and that, that as a matter of court culture, the norm among clerks is that you have to be extra sure that you, when you recommend a case for certiorari, because uh, it is better to uh, not recommend a case that should have been granted than to recommend a case that shouldn't have been. And I agree that should be changed. I'm skeptical that more justices would would produce more grants, and um, you know I'm also skeptical that more justices means there's um, easier to spread the work around because they've got to read each other's opinions. And so uh, I don't think that would necessarily result in more cases being granted. Um, I think that there might, you know, Congress might need to consider whether or not um, it should re-expand uh, uh, what used to be referred to as the appellate jurisdiction and, and, and the range of cases the court is, is expected or required to take. Um, one reform that would certainly help with the length of opinions is if you either got reduced the number of clerks or um, uh, prohibited computers, um, they write <laughs> shorter opinions again, and that might be a plus. Um, but uh, I, I think getting the court to accept more cases probably requires thinking about other ways of of addressing the court's jurisdiction. This reminds me of Gordon Tolick's advice about uh, seatbelts. And one sure way to make sure people drive safely is to put a large spike in the center of a steering wheel of every automobile manufactured in America. Uh, we're not on Gordon Tullock today. Uh, I do want to ask you each. And then you'd have to have a big warning label about it. Right. Well, I, I do want to ask you each to, to uh, give me maybe one minute uh, wrap up comment uh, with particular focus on something that you're working on that you're excited about. Uh, if you want to endear yourself to me and to CEI, you will emphasize administrative law and separation of powers. But the floor is yours, gentlemen. Uh, Ilya, then Jonathan, uh, cl closing remarks for us today. Sure. Well, uh, we just collaborated with CEI. Cato did. I did uh, uh, on a couple of administrative law cases challenging the Securities and Exchange Commission's administrative law judges and their accountability and and things like that, really uh, important cases, Gibson and, and Cochran. So I'm happy to do that. Um, but look, um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I think I've, I've said this, but it, it bears repeating, the only lasting solution to what ails our body juridic is to return to the Founders Constitution by rebalancing and devolving power. So Washington isn't making so many big decisions for the whole country. Depoliticizing the judiciary and toning down our confirmation process is a laudable goal, but that'll only happen when judges go back to judging rather than bending over backwards to ratify the constitutional abuses uh, of the other branches. Um, you know, the separation of powers and federalism exists not as some dry exercise in Madisonian political theory, but as a means to that singular end of uh, protecting our freedom. And so the reason we have these heated court battles is that the government, the federal government is simply making too many decisions at a national level for such a large, diverse and pluralistic country. Um, so, you know, let federal legislatures make the uh, legislators make the hard calls about truly national issues like defense or actually interstate actual commerce, but let states and localities make most of the decisions that affect our daily lives. Let Texas be Texas and 
California be California. And that's the only way we're going to diffuse tensions in Washington, whether in the halls of Congress or in the marble palace of the highest court in the land. And you, Professor Adler? Oh, I'd say two things. One, um, in terms of Ilya's book, I think it, you know, it's very useful to have the, the examination of history. There are all these claims made routinely about norms require this, that, or the next thing with regard to nominations. And I think the, the his history that, that he recounts helps blow up a lot of those notions that um, uh, the, these, are, these are fancier ways of people saying they want their side to win or think their side should be entitled to win. Um, we don't have these, these norms uh, that are well established about how we handle confirmations. Um, in terms of your question about things I'm working on, I'll promote uh, my marijuana federalism book for people that are interested in federalism and marijuana, available from Amazon and the Brookings Institution. Um, and I'm working on finishing a book relating to uh, environmental federalism uh, that, uh, you know, plays on similar themes, right? In the case of marijuana, it's, it's let California or Colorado be California and Colorado and let Nebraska and Oklahoma be Nebraska and Oklahoma. And in environmental policy, it definitely is let Texas be Texas and let California be California. Uh, these are two very different sets of issues that uh, would benefit from allowing decisions to be made by those who most directly bear the costs and reap the benefits of the policy choices. And uh, I agree with Ilya that if we had a court that helped push policy in that direction, that would definitely be a good thing. I'm not sure it would solve the problem of confirmation battles, but it would be a good thing and it would be better for our constitutional republic. Is, is there a good pun for the title of this new book? Because you have Uncle Sam and Mary Jane. Is this yeah, one like you know, green federalism? Can you believe it? Uh, no. well, n n nothing, nothing that clever, Ilya. I, you know, I'm just not as punny as you are. Uh, I want to thank you both, uh, both the book today, uh, the discussion, and the work that you do uh, throughout the year. Uh, it's both thorough and accessible, and both of those things are important. Um, we constantly need to remind people that the reading level on Capitol Hill is not uh, graduate school level. It's more like middle school. Uh, I really appreciate what you're doing uh, for scholarship and for liberty. I want to remind everyone that we'll be back next week with another book forum, University of Chicago economist and the recent chief economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Casey Mulligan will be here. We'll be talking on Wednesday about what he saw as part of the White House economic team in his book, You're Hired. Then on Wednesday, the 28th of October, we'll be back with another uh, in our series, Repeal for Resilience. We'll look at the Centers for Disease Control and Mission Creep with our own Sam Kasman and Michelle Minton, as well as special guests uh, from our friends down the street, National Civil Liberties Alliance, attorney Caleb Kruckenberg, who has an interesting case about a recent executive order uh, instructing the CD or coming from the, the activities of the CDC. Please don't forget to fill out that survey uh, buy Jonathan's book on uh, marijuana federalism, buy a couple copies of Ilya's new book on Supreme Disorder, and thank you all. That's the end of our program today. Thank you.